Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Zakili uh, here to talk to you today about athletes with autism. Um, I have no disclosures related to this presentation. Uh, to begin, we'll talk a little bit about background for these disorders. So autism spectrum disorders are a broad group of neurologic developmental disorders. They start early in childhood and they last uh, all through a person's life. They primarily affect how a person can interact with the world and communicate. Um, this includes what was once known as Asperger syndrome and pervasive developmental disorder. So it's a pretty broad developmental uh, category uh, based primarily off symptoms. The core symptoms for autism spectrum disorders are social communication challenges. These are both verbal and nonverbal and both receptive and productive. About 40% of patients with an autism, spect autism spectrum disorder are completely nonverbal and 25 or 30% begin verbal but then lose the ability. They also are characterized by restricted and problematic behaviors such as repetitive movements, narrow interests, uh, hyperactivity or attention deficits, and uh, aggression, irritability, and self-harm. When we talk about etiology, it's very important to understand this uh, in discussing with your community. Um, this is not caused by vaccines. Um, uh, that's been uh, clearly disproven. This is primarily a genetic disorder. And it's not a single disorder, it's more of a collection of uh, multiple various conditions. Uh, about 10, or 30 per 10 to 30% of these are specifically linked to one genetic uh, abnormality, um, and a large proportion are involved uh, with other conditions as well. Um, we see from our genetic uh, studies that uh, older parents uh, tend to have a higher risk, so that fits with other genetic disorders. Uh, in twin studies, we see that identical twins carry a much higher risk of a second uh, uh, sibling to be affected. So again, that confirms high amount of uh, genetic impact. Um, an example of the specific genetics behind this is a, a recent study on the 16p11.2 uh, deletion. So what this study showed is that there's some primary uh, abnormalities that set people up to develop this disorder. And then the second parent, the second parent contributes some genetic variants in the rest of their uh, genome that set off the rest of the disorder. So this is a recent uh, genomic sequencing and currently there's about 34 identified genes um, and uh, 13 of these genes or 10.4% of uh, cases in this series were new unidentified genes for these uh, patients. We also see here that uh, the gray area represents parents of autistic patients and uh, the red represents the patients themselves. You'll notice that there's some underlying depression or ADHD in these parents, but no real autism. Uh, and then we see in their offspring a uh, significant amount of autism when the second parent has some underlying uh, genetic abnormalities. Uh, so other things that can affect that there is some suspicion that uh, uh, environment can play a role, uh, 40 to 50%. The thought is that this is primarily uh, with regards to how much of the disorder is presented. It can be highly associated with multiple additional uh, conditions, and these also have play a role in how we treat these patients. The timeline, this always begins before three years of age, and uh, most of the children develop abnormalities by two years. Um, they're not always diagnosed, however. Uh, current screening is based off the MCHAT uh, um, checklist, uh, and uh, our results on that in research are great. We have 90% screening rates, uh, but in real life, uh, MCHAT is not as a, a successful. It catches only about a third of patients who have autism. Um, and so uh, there will be several children that may be missed in your communities, uh, particularly true of white uh, families, high socioeconomic status, females, and Hispanics. Uh, screening has improved, and so we now see a rate somewhere around uh, one and a half to two percent. So the effects of uh, autism spectrum disorder on the neuros neuromuscular system are pretty diverse. Uh, traditionally, this was thought of as a sensory uh, disorder. That's where this sensory slang word comes from when describing these patients. And so this is an example of a brain responsiveness to auditory um, uh, stimulus. And you can see that there's a delay in the bottom right corner between autism spectrum disorder patients and regular patients. Uh, but we now understand that that's, um, it's a much uh, more complex uh, setting. The kinetic chain is a great way to think about it. So when we think about this, uh, we think about postural control, sensation or, or information input, motor planning or information output and muscular function, which is actual uh, movement. And we can think about that uh, in the setting of a patient of what is me, where am I, where am I going and how am I getting there? And what we see is that in autism spectrum disorders, we affect all of these problems. So this is a recent study that looked at a physiologic profile for these patients. It looked at vision, sensation, reaction time, strength and balance. And what we saw is that patients performed below the 10th percentile in the majority of these findings. Only 20% of measurements were above the 50th percentile. To look at that a little bit more closely, 
this is an example of depth perception. So these dots represent patients. And you'll notice the majority fall below 50th percentile. So vision is affected clearly. Uh, peripheral sensation for both proprioce uh, proprioception and uh, pressure. We see, again, uh, very poor performance by the, of these patients relative to uh, norms. Same is true of reaction time, both for hand and foot reaction time. Again, majority of patients falling uh, below 50 percentile and uh, just over a quarter following in the uh, lowest 10th percentile function. Muscle function is actually affected uh, directly as well. And so this is a test just of strength. And what we see is that in this test, only 13 percent of tested subjects were above the 50th percentile. So there's a direct uh, relationship between strength and uh, autism spectrum disorders. And so this is what all of those put together look like. And what we see is on, as a whole, um, there's a, a really broad, uh, pervasive effect of autism spectrum disorders on patients' neuromuscular function. Uh, and this isn't just functional, it's anatomic. So this is a study that looked at brain imaging uh, in patients who have autism spectrum disorder and compared the imaging to both motor performances as well as symptom severity, such as the disruptive uh, symptoms we talked about. And what we saw is actual anatomic variations or loss of integrity in brain uh, uh, signaling tracks. So this is an anatomic effect uh, and uh, directly related. So how does all this translate? Well, this translates to not, the patients not having dynamic postural control. This is a computer simulated machine that attempts to uh, test our uh, coordination. And, and what we saw is that in autistic spectrum disorder patients, they have delayed uh, but fluid movement. And so you can see on the chart on the right, significant uh, decrease in the velocity of their response to an unstable uh, terrain. Uh, and this is particularly true in the side to side or uh, lateral movement, uh, and also, but also true in front to back anterior posterior movement. This is further complicated, this underlying uh, postural instability by an overlap with uh, hypermobility disorders. So there's a, a very large overlap with these genetic disorders, particularly Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, uh, patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndromes carry about a seven times increased risk for having autism spectrum disorders. Uh, we also see Fragile X and Marfan syndrome, both of which carry some hypermobility, playing a large role. Uh, and again, this is that 7.4 uh, times risk factor for autism. So combine the uh, postural control issues with hypermobility, you obviously have a problem. So in summary, we have pervasive deficits with anatomic changes, and the end result basically is a unstable patient with poor control and uh, hypermobility, which is a setup for injury. This is just like any of our um, uh, uh, poorly developed or poor core strength sort of athletes. So uh, how do we fix this? So clearly there are benefits of sports for autism spectrum disorders. We see this across the board. Um, uh, looking specifically at these, it's not isolated just to uh, strength. Uh, this was a study looking at socialized exercise programs, uh, evaluated jogging, running, uh, horseback riding. This is a, a meta-analysis of all uh, studies out there currently. Um, and what they found is most sports improve balance and athletic measures. It also decreased BMI. These patients are at a higher risk for obesity. Uh, there was some mixed evidence for social effects, but uh, for the most part, it seemed positive. And uh, very good evidence for horseback riding and martial arts, these core dominant or proprioception dominant sports. Um, when we look at this uh, prospective case series, this looked both at social skills as well as motor skills. And interestingly enough, the patients with the greatest impairment benefited the most. So it really highlights the importance of sports and, and exercise in this community. Um, in this particular cohort, this looked at 22 autistic uh, uh, children, compared them to typically developing matched uh, normals, and tested their uh, motor skills and uh, social skills. And what we saw here is that they had statistically significant improvements in the ability to run, gallop, skip, hop, um, strike and kick balls. Um, so all of these are uh, drastic improvements for these patients, and none of these improved in a control group. So it really shows that even though there's uh, anatomic change and pervasive abnormalities, we can improve them. We also see that there's a qualitative improvement in terms of the uh, overall uh, social function. Uh, in terms of planning the sorts of activities we do, there's some evidence uh, behind this as well. So this looked at the intensity and length of exercise relative to stereotypic behavior. So that's like rocking and hand flapping. And what they found was that uh, with a, a low to moderate intensity, so 50 to 65% of target heart rate uh, for a lower length of time, about 10 minutes, that for about an hour afterwards, some of these stereotypic activities were decreased and uh, overall patient reception, their ability to answer questions correctly and participate appropriately in school was improved. So that's uh, some, another positive thing that we can do with uh, exercise. We also know that the type of exercise seems to have an impact. So 
Um, exercises that mirror or match the uh, behavior of concern seem to have a larger effect. So in this study, uh, ball tapping or basically dribbling was able to reduce hand flapping uh, for about uh, an hour after a 10 minute activity. Similarly, jogging for 10 minutes was able to reduce body rocking for about an hour. Um, and, and then that uh, gradually returned, but there's a clear benefits uh, from a functional standpoint for this activity. So overall, the benefit of sports, there's clearly quantitative improvements in movement patterns and skills. There is some evidence for social benefits. We can reduce problematic behavior and, uh, and exercises focusing on core stability seem to have the best evidence and uh, effect. So how do we treat uh, autistic spectrum disorder athletes? Uh, first off, we need to understand what sort of injuries they get. So this is an, the only epidemiology study in these uh, group of athletes. It looked at eight schools with special education programs and an interscholastic sports league. This is high school age kids. Um, and what they basically found were two injuries per 1,000 athlete exposures. That's a bit higher than what we see for our typically developing patients. Um, the highest risk group of all of these special education subgroups was autism, which carried a five times increased risk compared to just standard uh, mental disability patients in this uh, group. We also saw a very high risk uh, in soccer. Um, and finally, you'll note that seizure disorders carried a high risk. Very important under to know autistic spectrum disorders are uh, very commonly associated with uh, epilepsy. So that's a double hit in those cases. In terms of the type of injuries we see, most of them occur with running or walking. There's two separate subgroups. So we see these collisions either with objects or people which result in abrasions and contusions. And then we see a smaller uh, amount, roughly 20%, that are twisting or hyperextension injuries that re result in sprains or strains. And so we see just what we saw in the anatomy, which is this is a coordination issue. And uh, in this hypermobility or uh, lack of uh, stability situation, we see the same sorts of injuries that we see, such as uh, ACL tears and that uh, uh, sort of uh, injury pattern. Uh, identifying injuries in these patients can be difficult. They have a really difficult time communicating. They also have a difficult time understanding and feeling their body. So there's a high probability that pain is disregarded or untreated in these patients. Uh, this was a systematic review specifically looking at pain in autistic children because there is an underlying myth that they are pain insensitive or have high pain thresholds. And they wanted to look for what the real evidence is. And the truth is that that's not true. Uh, there were only five case studies that reported pain and sensitivity, but all the experimental studies that they looked at actually showed altered expressions of pain in the autistic children. And if we look closely, the facts are concerning. So um, uh, the facts are, uh, instead of a uh, tolerance to pain, most of artistic spectrum patients in these studies showed uh, increased sensitivity. So they're more likely to consider touch painful. They um, were more likely to have sensitivity to thermal pain. And in the setting of an IV, they demonstrated higher heart rates and endorphins, even though they were less likely to be considered uh, in pain by an observer. So we're very likely to miss pain in these patients and as a result, are likely to miss uh, injuries. Uh, that's really important to note because unfortunately, mortality rates on following simple injuries in these patients is significantly increased. Uh, it's about 50% higher for this group of patients than uh, in typically developing patients. So what's our recommendation? Well, we need to um, uh, understand this limitation of communication and uh, fix, uh, fix this. We, they have trouble verbalizing, so what do we do? We, we have to ask in a new way. So this chart on the right is just one example of a way we can ask pa uh, autistic patients about their discomfort. Also, they have trouble sometimes experiencing pain, but discomfort is more easily recognized by these patients. Treating injuries, um, largely uh, recommended for that is preventative care. So we've gone through all the deficits they have, primarily with score and uh, core strength and stability. And so uh, taking a, a large focus on that in a preventative fashion uh, is really important. Additionally, activity selection for these patients is important. So collision sports or sports where there's large uh, amounts of uh, traffic may be dangerous for these patients. Uh, in terms of the rest of our treatment, uh, we want to be careful with ice and heat. These can be uh, considered painful stimuli for these patients and actually worsen uh, symptoms and be very distressing. In terms of mobilization, because these patients are so uh, sensitive to proprioception uh, and uh, touch uh, and oversensitive at times, we have to be very careful about how we immobilize injuries. So um, uh, sometimes have to be creative. So soft braces as opposed to casts in some uh, cases or on the other extreme, uh, can some sometimes consider increasing uh, in, uh, stabilization with larger or more restrictive because these patients will have a, a hard time keeping them on and sometimes try and get out. And so that having that communication with the care team for what the best solution is for some of these injuries is probably the best answer. Uh, so in summary, these are injuries of uh, incoordination. Uh, and so an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of uh, treatment. Uh, 
Uh, pain is largely underreported, and we have to have a high index of suspicion. Should check in with these patients regularly and watch for change in behaviors that can uh, subtly signal pain. We need to consider alternate communication and creative treatments uh, if they do get injured. So overall, for sports and autistic spectrum disorders, this is, again, a, a pervasive uh, condition. It's predominantly genetic, and it affects the entire neuromuscular chain and is uh, dominantly um, affecting the coordination and posture of our patients. And uh, the presence of hypermobility further complicates this. Uh, as a result, we need to focus heavily on core strengthening and stabilization activities. Uh, sports clearly can have a very uh, strong effect on this in a positive manner. And so ideal programming should uh, be inclusive of these activities. Um, repetitive activities are helpful for these patients because they enjoy routine in most cases. And moderate intensity is more effective than uh, high intensity. We also know that uh, the ideal activities, again, should focus on core stabilization and proprioception. So again, things like uh, martial arts or uh, uh, um, horseback riding. Sports and exercise can control the more problematic and disruptive behaviors in these patients and it can improve their socialization and uh, effectiveness in school. And so it should be encouraged. Um, but uh, with that does come the risk of injuries, particularly with the above uh, concerns. So they're frequently missed. You need to stay vigilant, uh, check in with these patients frequently as well as their caregivers uh, and keep your eyes open. Uh, thank you for your time.